Here we go. All right. Bear with us just a few more moments while we get everything um, rocking and rolling here. I'm Emily Walrath Schmidt. I'll be your talking head for the evening. Behind the scenes is Gillian Weinman, our deputy director. So um, as maybe you heard, we are recording this. We're also broadcasting this live on Facebook um, and then you can view that later too. So hopefully we are rolling. Okay, now um, welcome one, welcome all. So you know, everyone is muted. No one can see each other. You can only see me. So if you didn't wear pants tonight, that's fine. Um, if your cat is in the room with you, even better. Um, we will answer questions at the end, but you can type in questions as we go. You'll see there's a question box. There's also a chat box. Please put your questions in the Q&A, not the chat. I mentioned this, we're recording, yay. And then um, all the links that I mentioned here are available on our House Research 101 blog on our website. Uh, so don't try to scramble for links. You can access them at your leisure later. And then in the event of a technical difficulty, we will shut down the webinar and email a new time. We don't anticipate that happening, but stranger things. Um, you know, I'm coming to you live from my home office in Uptown. Uh, so we'll just see. And then just a reminder that this is best viewed on a computer or a large iPad, um, not your phone. Uh, I'm gonna be sharing screens and going through examples with you, and it might be difficult on a tiny screen. Okay, away we go. I know this is a pointer too, it's pretty rad. Okay, so no matter what kind of house or apartment you're in, this Research 101 will give you a whole bunch of tools to use to research uh, your dwelling or any building. It's all public information, it's all perfectly legal. So, um, you know, if you're ever getting the urge to look up an ex-boyfriend, don't, just research your house instead. It's a much better idea. And research is the who, what, when, where, why of your building. So who lived there, who built it? What is it? When was it made? Um, and I'm here to tell you how. And this is our research from home edition. So I'm sticking to all online resources um, because I know you can't get out right now anyway. Or if you do, it's very limited. Wear your mask. Okay, so let's go way back. It's probably been a while since you thought about primary sources or secondary sources. A secondary source is a biography, a textbook, a beautiful neighborhood book that shows you know, the development of where you live. Your house isn't in there. Thankfully, we have a bunch of primary sources um, that were created during the period that we're studying, aka when your house was built, like building permits, deeds, maps, newspaper articles, um, so you can uncover the story of your house uh, yourself. It's pretty rad. And these, my friends, are the six basic steps that we will use um, to go through and uh, find out the history of your house. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of explain what each of the steps is, maybe show some examples, and then for some of these, I'm actually gonna take us to the internet and do a live uh, tutorial of how to access the website. Um, it sounds silly and a little pedantic, but it's not. These are kind of not always the most user-friendly, so I'm very grateful that they exist. So we need to find out when your house was built and also your, um, uh, your PIN. We need to download a map. We need to locate your building permit. Number four is the one that's kind of in brackets. Um, you can trace your deed once things uh, open back up. So we'll touch on that, but we won't go in depth. We're gonna identify who lived there with census reports and city directories. And then we're gonna learn more about the people through newspaper articles. Um, this is a webinar, so if any time you need to take a restroom break or get a snack, I won't even know. So let's get started, okay. Uh, I mentioned this just a moment ago. This right here is the research blog on our website that has these listed out step by step in more of a narrative form. Check that out after the presentation. This is the worksheet um, that's mentioned in the blog. If you download it, uh, it's not the end all be all, it's just a reminder to keep good track of your research because you'll probably get excited and forget where you found something, you wanna go back and not be able to find it. So two resources that are at your fingertips that you don't have to worry about right now but I do want you to have in your back pocket. Okay, so let's do this one first. Now, if you own your home, 
you probably are very well the Cook County Assessor. Um, well, they have a website that you can enter in your address and find out your property index number. That's your PIN. That's like the legal, it's like the social security number for your house. Um, and then you can also find out how old your house is, which is important for what we're doing. <clears throat> so this is the website. Um, these are the, the information you can find, your PIN's up here. And then the age of your house is another very important piece because based on how old your house is, you do different, um, different things. Now I'm gonna click on this. This is our first experiment. Will it work? Yay, technology. Okay, so let's just enter in a house number. This is the Cook County Assessor's site. A little lag time, but we're good. Let's just do this one. It's the number separate from the direction. You can skip over unit number and then the street name. And last but not least, Chicago. This is a county-wide database. So if you live in a different county, uh, you can do that. Okay. So normally there's only one, there's two here, don't worry about it. Here we are, our pin. And then to find out the age of your house, just go to characteristics, click that snazzy down tab, and there you are, 104 years old. So if we do the math, 104 years ago was 1916. This house was built around 1916. Great, that's important, 1916. Now, um, back into Bruce. Ah, there we go. Woo! Technology people. Okay, so the reason it's important to find out the age of your house early on is because if your building is 111 years or older, you may have had a different street number or different street name. City of Chicago was renumbered in 1909, the loop in 1911. So if you've ever walked by an apartment building like a two flat and seen like a different street number on there than what it actually is now, this is why. Um, also, just a word of caution that street names have changed. So, modern day 116 West Irving Road is actually, was in the past 1134 Graceland Avenue. Just putting that out there. Um, this is a quick little map showing when the different areas of the city became Chicago. Um, so, you can see by around, you know, 1909, things would have been changing and you might have to remember. So, that's why. Uh, there's a really cool primary source, uh, the plan of renumbering city of Chicago that you can access. Um, you can see it was published in 1909 and it has the old street numbers and the new street numbers and it's alphabetical by street name. So check that out if that applies to you. All right, this is where things get exciting. Uh, the next thing you can do is download your Sanborn Company fire insurance map. I'll check, make sure that Gillian isn't trying to yell at me about anything going on. No, I think we're good. Okay. Um, so insurance companies, you may love them, you may hate them. We all know that they're very detailed. And starting in the 1880s, this company, the Sanborn Fire Insurance Map Company, started doing city maps so that they could offer insurance based on how um, flammable or inflammable, that doesn't mean the same thing, how burnable your building was. So they made detailed maps of building materials, building dimensions, building uses, because if you have a you know, furnace in your house or you're doing um, crazy chemical stuff like in a business, people would want to know that. Um, so today we can access them at different points in history. They were uh, updated in Chicago through 1951. Um, so we can see all of these things. You can help extrapolate what changes or additions were done to your house, what your house configuration would have been originally, and then um, how your neighborhood evolved. And they are online for free on the Chicago Public Library site. Now, if you tried to do this in the past, Chicago Public Library recently changed their Sanborn Map subscription. So it's actually easier now, but it still takes some doing. And the slide you see on the screen, um, I just wanted to show you how large the original maps are. You know, they're, they're enormous, you can put your hands on them. And once COVID is over, I encourage you to go to the Chicago History Museum and touch some of these. Um, you can see that the texture on the surface of the map, because as buildings were torn down, added, changed, they would just paste over the top. So you have kind of a cool uh, patchwork quilt of, of buildings. I love the maps. I want a wallpaper bathroom in them someday. Um, you could too. So 
this is just to show this is the Avondale neighborhood, how I pulled the map from 1921. Wow, it's developing. By 1950, it's like, you know, full on um, bungalow neighborhood. Um, if you look down here, you can see how the, the light industry in the neighborhood has changed too. Uh, this is from the old system when they were black and white, they're now um, full color, which is important. I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, so here is a close up of a South Shore Street, South Euclid Avenue, not Parkway, but Avenue, um, showing a detail of the Sanborn map. Even without knowing what any of those colors and notations mean, you can put it side by side with a Google Street View uh, and see this is the building that we're looking at. That's that one right there. Oh, the garage has changed shape. Oh, uh, this one's been demolished entirely. I think that building's been ex extended. You can just kind of see things visually um, comparing them, which is super fun. And then if you dial in on, let's say this is your house, let's go through and, and say, or learn what all these different little um, things mean. Okay, so first is what kind of building is this? It's a D dwelling, which means there were one or two family units within a dwelling. Most of these mean single family home. Um, a means auto, it's an auto garage. 1880s when this started, there were still a lot of horse stables. So if your um, garage was originally for horses, it will say that. Most bungalow neighborhoods though were built for automobiles. Next, so different colors. Uh, some people call this pink or red. That means solid brick construction. Important when you're doing things like fire insurance, if it's a fireproof material. Um, the yellow is frame construction. So you see in this house, uh, the house is brick, as we'd expect from a bungalow, and the garage is frame, porches are frame, which is wood as well. Now, it tells you how tall your building was when this map was made. We have one and a half stories with a basement. That's what that means. And if you're curious like what one and a half means, it seems kind of like how can a building have a half story? That's uh, the attic. So a bungalow has one full height story and then the attic is considered the half story. If you have a, a Victorian style house, you might have two or three and a half stories with the attic. If you have a two flat, you probably just have two stories. So that's what that all means. Um, it shows that this porch was one story and the garage was one story as well, which makes some good sense. All right. Now, these black dots, this is good. This means that the roof material was composition, which is uh, an asphalt shingle. Asphalt shingles popularity coincided with the rise of the bungalow era, so this isn't surprising. Um, if it was a wood shingle, it would be just a circle with a hole. Um, if it was a terracotta shingle, they would call that out too. So if you've ever been curious about what your roof was, you can actually know definitively tonight. Um, and then these dotted lines versus closed lines, this porch is open. So, uh, you know, if you picture walking out onto a back porch with just the posts and a roof, that's an open porch. This one is enclosed. That's probably changed too. If you've ever wondered why your floor is slanted, it's because it was an open porch originally. Okay, and then this is not Friar Gables. There was no monk here. This means frame gables, which once again, if you're thinking about how fireproof your house is or is not, you need to know where there's wood. Um, and then these are all about windows and wall thickness. Uh, not, oh, we have a chat, hold on. Okay, cool, Never mind. We're good. Back to it. Thanks, Gillian. Um, our wall thickness is eight inches in depth. So that's what that eight is. You'll see these in different number markings. Um, they're not infinity signs bad. Um, this one right here is really neat. This means that there is one, there are window openings on floor one, which we'd expect from a bungalow. So you have this dot, which means that there's a window opening, and we have this one um, line there, which means it's the first floor. You'll see these with more than one line um, on different styles of houses. Did I miss anything there? And if you were wondering whose house this is, Michelle Obama's childhood bungalow. And this is what it looks like. So you can see the value in this. It's not gonna tell you everything you need to know about your house, but it will tell you an awful lot about what was there originally or very shortly after it was built. And it can help you decide uh, what may or may not have um, occurred. All right, so that's all fine and well, but how do you do it? 
let's go to uh, the Chicago Public Library's website, which you can do after this. I would, wouldn't recommend you do it right now. Log in with your uh, library card. It's doing it, it's happening. And then this is your landing page. Click on the interactive map. Enter in your address. Oh, I already did it to practice, so it's right there. And then click go. And through the magic of the internet, it places a pin at the building you're looking up. And then you can scroll down and see all of the Sanborn maps and dates available for your address. Um, there are other maps here. I encourage you to noodle around with those. Uh, they may or may not actually show your house. Some of these just show neighborhoods. So um, just the word of the wise. Um, but let's go down to the Sanborn area. So we see one from 1913. We know that our building wasn't built yet. Our building's from around 1916. So I'm not going to click on that one. I'm going to go straight to 1923, which is just a few years after it was built. So this is going to be a pretty good indication of where to find it. All right, so here we are. What? Nothing happens. Well, you gotta click on the sheet. And first, you click on sheet number zero. Just click on it. And zoom in. And when you zoom in, it's important that you get to your neighborhood or your blocks. So you know what number sheet you need to visit next. This is very important. So we're on Euclid Avenue uh, between 74th and 75th. So it's color coded between map sheets, so this is helpful. So we need to go to sheet number 11. Now, before you navigate out of this, just go right back up and download that JPEG so you can save it for your in your research file. Um, yeah, it's great to to have a you know a track record of where you went. Plus, these are just so beautiful. You can really frame one for your living room. Okay, so sheet number 11 is what we wanted. So I go over here and I see there's sheet number 11. I'm gonna click on it and we have another map. And this is where I can zoom in and get to 7436. And this is the one that I had blown up in the earlier example. And as you click to zoom in, it clarifies. So at first, if it looks fuzzy, it gets sharper. Um, and then don't forget to go up and download your map. Um, you can open it in a new window if you want. Um, I find it easier to work with the uh, uh, file images as opposed to keeping on this uh, internet interface. It can get weird. Also, these buttons, if you want to add, like, oh, this is the house I'm looking at. Cool, but sometimes you can click them and it gets convoluted. So um, you now have your first Sanborn map. Great, but I want to look at other maps. Don't hit start over. Just go back and hit results to get back to that page that has uh, the other maps on them. Okay, scrolling down. So we had 1923, let's go all the way to 1951. End of the line, last possible information. Once again, I click on map zero. Oh, this I had from an earlier one. Wow, cookies work on this website, so let's just delete that. So once again, zoom in. Typically, they, um, you know, throughout the editions that you have, like 1921, 1948, 1951, whatever range you have, they'll be the same um, number. But I always just like to double check because I'm like that. That's me. Uh, download your map. Cool. Go to sheet number 11. This is once again 1951. Now you can see that the neighborhood has filled in. And not in our exact area, but it looks like right here, they've definitely pasted over some new buildings and made some changes. Um, you can kind of see the layers and texture of it. And then we can get back to our building. And um, yeah, there has been some pasting over this one, but mm, doesn't look like the building itself has actually been modified. So you might, you might see a big change, you might see nothing, uh, but it's fun to do. Okay. So that is Sanborn maps. Make sure that you're saving them, downloading them, um, so that you can trace your research. Don't outsmart yourself. It's easy to get excited. All right, um, back to this. Hope that's making sense. Normally, if we're like in a 
classroom, I can look around, I see nodding heads or people look confused or yelling at me. Um, obviously, we don't have that now. So let's talk about building permits. This is where things get very hot and heavy. And um, you are going to want to maybe come back to this. So I'm going to go through it. Uh, and in the interest of time, uh, you know, maybe faster than you want, but let's just try. Okay, so post fire, so 1872 to 1954, when there was a different uh, format, uh, you have building permits. Um, they are, it's a two part system to look them up. There's a file card, an ancient building file card, and then the actual permit. Um, and they were just recently digitized by the University of Illinois at Chicago. So before this, you had to go to a library. Now you can do it from your couch. Um, and these are important to look up if you're researching your home because they have that super popular uh, item, the architect. It also has the owner at time of construction uh, this isn't always the first person who lived there. Just like today, people build houses, there are developers, large scale and small scale. Um, but you can see who did it. Uh, the date of the applications, you know exactly when your house was started and completed, as well as a contractor. Um, sometimes, like today again, homes don't have an architect, it's a contractor builder who does it. And then um, the estimated cost of construction, which is just interesting and will kind of make you feel bad. Um, Though a lot of times these are underestimated because you paid your permit fees and taxes on um, the cost. So people lied. Uh, and then also progress of construction. So this is, this is exciting. Um, these, this is the old, um, these are the old microfilm files that were digitized. These microfilm files were um, done in the 1950s. So all of the paper records were put onto microfilm, the you know, hot, future archiving of the day. Um, and they lived like this for 50 more years until the UIC just digitized them. Um, so the experience, even looking at them digitally, is mimicking how you would look at them on microfilm. If you've ever used one of these, you know it's kind of horrible and can make you sick. Um, I get motion sickness from microfilm. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Um, but just keep that in mind as we're going through. So use the microfilm part of your brain when you're trying to understand this, once we do the demonstration. Okay, but let's look at the, the ancient building file card and the permit file to see what information is on there and what information we need to record when we're doing it. So this one right here is the, the building file card, so in the card catalog. I can see rather unclearly um, the permit number. Is that a two, is that a seven? I don't know why penmanship wasn't like a good criteria for getting jobs in this office way back when, but it wasn't. Um, this is important. The South and 11, S means South, make a note of that. Um, and then file number and date of permit. Whenever I find the building card, I download it. Also note all of that information because when I'm looking at the permits, when I'm scrolling through the permit pages, things are varying degrees of clear. So you might not actually be able to read the file number, but you can read the permit number or the date or the address on the file card. I'm sorry, on the permit. So here right here is an example of the permit that we're gonna be looking for. Once again, not the most clear, um, but these range wildly in how legible they are. And that relates to the digitization process, but also the filming process from when they are originally turned from paper to microfilm. So um, you just never know what you're gonna get. And the permits themselves are stored in a book like as big as the Sanborn map book. And there's multiples to a page. And this is the one that I cropped out so that we could see it. And then looking at this a little bit closer, um, here's what information I mentioned you can find. Uh, permit number, I, I don't know if I ever decided if that's a seven or a two, but the file number is clear. Um, the date is sort of clear. But we see the owner, we see the architect, that's H. Schmidt. No relation to me, but uh, pretty cool. The contractor, the number of stories, we already know this from the Sanborn map, but cool to know. Um, brick is not crossed out, so we know it was a brick building. And this is interesting. 
So typically for a bungalow, you'd expect it to say residential. Someone started writing that and then crossed it out because I think there were two units in this bungalow. And if you've read Coming by Michelle Obama, I'm a big fan, um, you know that she lived in the upstairs apartment. In the area of the building, this is cool if you're trying to figure out um, if there have been major additions or alterations to the footprint. Uh, you can measure your house against this. And then complaints, reports, and then this final report is the date that we actually use for when the you know, when it was officially built and put in service. Um, so it looks like March 19th, 2015. I'm sorry, 1915. March 19th, 1915. And it cost about $5,000. Take that with a grain of salt. Okay, uh, moving on. So this is the building again. This is just typed out. I don't actually know if that's what the contractor was. Um, I'd have to look back a little bit closer, but just kind of putting it in a typeface for you instead of handwriting. Now, are you ready to get your hands a little dirty and do a little tutorial? This is where things could get dicey. So um, bear with me. Also, if you don't care about this part, go grab snack. Uh, I'll be here talking to myself and all of you. Okay, so this is the landing page when you click the link provided. Uh, you want to click on the browse building permits. I uh, just want to mention that they do have a detailed description of how to do this. Um, I myself am a visual learner, so I do better with a you know walkthrough as opposed to a narrative. But if you learn the other way, please do read all of this information. Someone worked really hard on it. So click on your building permits, and then um, go to the street index, the Chicago Building Permit Street Index. This is where you get that first ancient building file card. All right, so we know our building is, um, I'm like, okay, I don't wanna get, I don't want any spoilers here. Uh, we know from our research that, um, wait, let me pause here. Woo, getting ahead of myself because I practiced today, so I'm, I'm one step ahead. Okay, this is easy. You need to look up and find the role that has the range of your address. So we're looking up South Euclid Avenue. So let's scroll on down until we get to the E's. Where are you, E's? All right. Oh, there we are, Emerald Avenue to Evans Avenue. Grant. And we're going to click on this one. And then, brace yourself, you're about to be transformed back into time. Ta-da! It's a reel. Um, so, you can see up here that we are in page one of 4,737. I don't know about you, but I am, would be less than enthusiastic about scrolling through these one by one. You do not have to do that. You can jump around, go to view film, and then it's like you're scrolling faster. Still not fast enough for me. What I like to do instead is go here. Oh, we have a raised hand. This is exciting. Gillian, I'm going to leave that to you. Cool. Okay. Um, sorry, this is a new uh, interface for me as well. So you don't want to scroll through all these. There's way too many. Go up right here and just get weird typing in. Okay, let's go to the middle of the stack. Let's go to page 2000 and see where that takes us. Where are we at in the alphabet? Oh, we're only in Erie. We need to get to Euclid. That's a long way. So the street number and the um, uh, street itself. Well, through the magic of um, production here, I know that we are on page 4044. Let's get there. Ah, Euclid Avenue. There is our index card. So you see how I did that? I found the right um, street number range and street number. I used my powers of deduction to fast forward through the rolls to get to a spot and then I found it. What I do here is I will download it because I love to download. Uh, you can choose your format. Um, if you need to enhance it, you can do all kinds of fun things like despeckling. Who knew that was a verb? To try to make it clearer, that didn't really make mine clearer. Um, if things are skewed, you can de-skew them. If things are you know, warped, it flattens it, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
or you can trim it if you need to. I just like to download them as they are and then in my own desktop thing, kind of get weird with them. Um, okay, and then we will get out of here. Cool, we have our permit, great. This is in the audience where everyone would be glazing over or nodding heads. Now we can actually go and try to find our building permit. So let's get back to the main page. So we go into the permit ledgers. It's another wild west of internet. All right, so remember how on that original card there was that S11 um, and I saw the date. Maybe we didn't talk about that too clearly. Let me show you this. Hold on. See how we have the date here, October 23rd, 1914. We have S11, we have some more numbers. Okay, well, let's go back to our digital reel. Now we use our brains. You see that each of these has neighborhoods, city areas, date ranges, north, south. You gotta look at them closely as you're going through and think both directionally and space-timely and figure out where you are. So I did this before again. I know that we are um, 16. As you see, oh, it says right there, book 11 South. And our date range is November 5th, 1913 through October 24th, 1914. Our building permit was October 23rd, 1914. This is great. That means we know that our building permit should be at the end of the roll. So when I open it, once again, some cool black and white film. I don't have to click through this and start guessing. I can go straight to the back of the book. Um, and I know that it's on page 638 of 639 because I did this before. And then we have dun, 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 this whole page um, that if I was trying to find this for the first time, I'd be zooming in, looking at it. And like the Sanborn maps, as you zoom in, it does get clearer. At first, it looks very fuzzy. Once the spinning wheel stops, then it gets clearer. You, know, you scroll in, zoom in, zoom in. It's my zoom face, zoom in. Um, and you have the record that we're looking for. One other thing I wanted to mention, um, so sometimes when you're looking at these, there are various levels of clear or not. I had no idea what architect this might be, so I just noodled around and looked at the records next door, and oh, that's H. Schmidt as well. That's much clearer on the next record, so I could kind of guess that that might be the, um, the one that we were looking for. So that is our um, grand mystery. And here, you can either download the whole thing or um, you can draw a zone, click on this one, and then you can draw a nice little box around the record that you want. And it zooms in on that as well as you can download that with any adjustment you want to make. Okay, so that is like kind of the weirdest part about this. Um, Two-step process, you have to digitally scroll through the rolls um, sometimes they're out of order, sometimes they're missing entirely, sometimes they're illegible. Um, if you're having a major issue with this, email me or get in contact with UIC directly. Their librarians will help you too. They have to. They work there and they're all very nice. Um, and then um, just a word to the wise, there are only so many users that can be on this database at the same time. So if you ever get kicked out or can't get in, it means like, eight other people are trying to do it at the same time. Uh, so stagger, stagger. Okay, now let's get back up and running. Hopefully this all made sense, we're nodding, we're good. Now, I'm off winter back. If you're in a historic district, you get a get out of jail free card because someone's already pulled your building permit uh, and gotten this information for their uh, district nomination. Uh, we have 14 bungalow historic districts listed on the National Register. Our most recent was Gage Park. We're very proud of our districts. Um, there are other ones. If you're not in a bungalow, 
Um, if you don't know if you're in one or not, you can look it up on the zoning and land use map page. Just make sure that you click over here. Sorry, my little window's over there. That you click the National Register filter option so that it pulls it up. It will let you know if you're in a district. Um, and then, if you are, um, real quick, I want to mention that there are contributing and non-contributing buildings in a district. That actually shouldn't matter. They would have had to pull your thing anyway, but um, this is a boundary map. And you can see that there are two different categories, contributing and non-contributing. Uh, this is the South Shore District. Um, so if that's the thing and you're confused by that, email me, I'll explain it. Um, and this right here is uh, an example of a National Register nomination. It's really like a history paper about your neighborhood into a government form, uh, which is some really interesting stuff about the development, the architectural styles, all that jazz. Um, you can read through that or you can skip to and search the PDF, the bottom for where they list out all of the contributing buildings and based on this varies how this looks exactly in different forms. Um, but you can see that someone has gone through and, and um, pulled those building files and gotten that information for you. So you can save yourself a lot of time. So this is 2423 West Coil um, from the nomination. All that great information is right there for you at your fingertips. And Q&A, we want to talk more about um, historic districts and what those are, what those mean. We can, we can come back to that. All right, this next one, number four, is an in-person kind of thing, uh, tracing your deed. Why would you want to do that? Well, um, it's, you know, the legal history of your property. Um, it actually is tied to the land and not the building, so it can even predate the building. Um, it will tell you everybody, if you trace your deed back through what's called a chain of title. You will know everyone who owned your home. Um, and that's important for some landmarking processes. Some, sometimes they require um, a total chain of deed. You're not landmarking your house, so don't worry about that. Um, but some people just want to know everything. Obviously, it only lists out the owner and not the occupants. So, um, you know, this is a, you might know the man who lived there, but no one else. Um, it's also helpful to determine when alterations or additions happened. Uh, just like when you bought your house, you probably moved in and changed some stuff within a few years. Um, so knowing when your house was sold can kind of help you date additions and alterations. Um, okay, then once we're back up and running, sorry, I'm click on the right thing here. You can go downtown, uh, you enter in this beautiful building and then this, uh, the office is in the basement. So it's kind of like one of those Pinterest fails where you're like, it's beautiful. And you're like, oh gosh, I'm in the basement. Um, but everyone there is very nice and they will help you do that. You just need to show up with your address, some cash money for um, copies and then um, patients and your uh, pin number helps too. Um, if you're curious for anything back to 1985, that is available online. Though I don't know how much good it will do you. Okay, moving right along. What's our time? Oh good, okay. Um, now, this is where things I think start to get interesting. We can look up, we can know more about who actually lived in the house. Not just who built it or who owned it, but who lived there and um, what they did, what they were all about. Um, census records are one of the great ways to do that. Uh, if you haven't filled out your census yet, this year is a census year, so make sure you do that. Um, they are taken every 10 years and it tells you great stuff. Name, age, male or female, occupation. Was this person a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, a homemaker, an artist, a student? You can find all that out. Their marital status, um, as well as you know who else lived in the house. You might be surprised by how many people lived in your house at one point. Um, extended families. It's, it's a good. It's a good place to really kind of start to color the history of your home. Okay, so this is a census. Form. Maybe you've seen these through your own genealogy research. Uh, you can look them up for other people too. Um, they go block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, once again, handwriting was not always a um, requirement or good penmanship was not a requirement for employment in this office. Uh, so sometimes you have to really look hard. Um, or if you use Ancestry.com, um, you just type in names and they, you can click on census records. Um, 
if you have a ancestry subscription for your own genealogy research, once you find out the name of anybody who's lived in your house, you can type them in here and try to find them. Um, you can you know, save it to a different shoebox. You don't get confused with yourself. Uh, but if you don't have Ancestry.com subscription, Chicago Public Library is offering it free at home through the end of the month. So get on this one right away. Uh, you can always go to the Chicago Public Library branch and log in from their computer and access this resource free of charge. Uh, but I mean, I'm a research from home person, so this is much more appealing. Um, so do that, start to figure out who lived in your house when it can get addictive. Um, so if you need to get to bed early, don't start doing some of this research that night. Um, city directories are another great way to find out more about who lived in your house. Uh, if you're old enough to remember the phone book, and I'm pretty sure everybody on here probably remembers the phone book, um, this is just like that. You can find a lot from the 1880s through 1929 online. Um, one of the ones that I like to use is a crisscross directory, which lists the address. So you look up address and then it lists who lives there instead of looking up name to find their address, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm gonna show you that in a minute, but just know that there are a wide range of these that have been digitized that you can search through various um, websites. There are also hard copies of these at a lot of archives and museums. So once things open back up, um, this could be a great purposeful outing. Uh, so here's an example of a city directory. I don't even think I noted the year on this, but this one looks very much like a phone book. Now this one is one of those crisscross directories that I was mentioning, uh, 1928, 1929. You see Kenmore Avenue and then the street numbers listed out. And these are apartment buildings I know because I live in one. Um, it lists all the people who occupied the different numbers and then their spouses too. So uh, it's kind of cool if you just, you know, pick 1928, 29, maybe your house wasn't built that year, that's fine. Uh, you can go and see who lived there at that moment in time. And that gives you further uh, leads for research. So um, the Chicago History Museum has this crisscross directory accessible through this link. Now it's a little, it's like an old link that I wanted to show you. We have this on the blog for linking. Um, but you have to do it this way and not another way to use it. So for example, K, if you live on Kenmore Street, click on K, it'll download a PDF of just the K street names, starting with Karlov. And you can scroll down, you can download the whole thing or you can scroll down on here until you find um, your street and who lived there. Just a word of the wise, if you click this main menu button, it takes you back someplace weird, um, which is why I wanted to explain this. Well, that's not working. Oh, well, the main menu button is not working. If you go to the main menu here, these don't click. If you go to the about, cool, but you can't get to any of the pages this way. So just click the link to this crazy antiquated table of contents and find your addresses that way. Cool. That one's easier to explain in person too, but just wanted to mention it. Okay. Let's close these down. Let's get back to our presentation. So census records, great way to find out. City directories, great way to find out. Now this is my favorite part, though I kind of say every part's my favorite part. This is actually it. Newspapers have been digitized and are accessible at your fingertips, and you can really bring the history of your house to life. Um, but I want you to be very prepared for surprises. Don't start poking around newspaper archives if you don't want to find out what really happened at your house. You might find nothing. You might find a uh, you know, real estate ad from like the 1950s, but you might find something weird. So you've been cautioned, um, now have at it. Um, there are also different real estate reports, construction reports, you know, you can find out some like facts and data about your house in addition to facts and data about the people. So let's look at a few. Okay, so I used to live uh, at 4837 North Kenmore. It's a lovely three flat graystone. Uh, when I first started noodling around, uh, you know, I found 
um, the land for sale. Oh, that was thrilling. Okay, cool. This is the old street address before the number changed. Look at it's 1906 or 1909. So it's an old number. Cool. This describes my apartment. Lovely. Oh, a garage was built in 1922. This is all so interesting and pedestrian. Well, I started, or I kept looking at every article I could find, and I found something that has stuck with me ever since. Um, now, in 1915, Miss, Mrs. Elizabeth Giedler uh, was a cook who lived at my address, and she committed suicide on the grave of her son in Montrose Cemetery on the one-month anniversary of his death. And um, I was, you know, like, Ugh, when I saw this. And this is the kind of history I wasn't expecting to find. But now, I think often and fondly of Mrs. Giedler. Um, and it's just like a very dramatic thing to learn. It's also interesting, I think, to look at what was going on in the news around anything you might find out about your house. Um, this article that talks about the horrible suicide also mentions the floating morgue um, after the East Lake disaster. That's when the uh, boat in the Chicago River tipped over um, and almost everyone aboard drowned. Um, wow, things are getting really dark today. Um, but, you know, pay attention to what's happening in your house, but also what's happening in the broader thing. I think it makes history more interesting. Um, now, the internet is a truly weird place. So, <laughs> Um, I ended up finding a photo of um, Mrs. Fiedler's grave. She was buried next to her son, just like the article said. And, um, you know, I get emotional every time I think about it. Uh, and if you go keep going in the newspaper records, you see that just a few years later, there's an ad for um, a cook for 4837 North Kenmore Avenue. So, uh, you know, life does go on. These houses have a history that outlasts us, outdates us, and keeps going. So I take a little comfort in the continuation of history. All right, um, on a lighter note, hopefully that wasn't too weird for anyone. Um, on a lighter note, sometimes when I'm trying to figure out when different building trends occurred in past, I'll use research, or I'll use newspapers um, to research things. Like I wanted to find out where all the fireplaces and those windows on the either side of fireplaces went at some point in history. Uh, so I used the newspapers. I found some cool interior photos of actual bungalows. Uh, if you're at 2934 North Kilbourne and you're on the Zoom call, raise your hand. I'd love to meet you. This is your house. Um, so you can get lucky and find stuff like that. Uh, this was not original, nor was the arch, but it's cool to know. Uh, same thing with this mirrored wall. They uh, took out the windows, or they covered up the windows with a big mirrored thing in 1951. So interesting things to find. If this is your house, you get really lucky just entering the address. Okay, so let's do a little demo. Um, if you haven't searched newspapers before, there's no real trick to it. It's just you got to be a little persnickety. Um, so let's click on this, another Chicago Public Library resource. Um, if you click on, you know, the link from the blog, it will take you to this page. Um, they have a bunch of newspapers. And you can see some are digitized, some are still on microfilm. Um, I'm going to use just this one because it's on the top. It's the Chicago Tribune. Um, but poke around them. Uh, see what newspaper makes sense to you. And then um, here's where we enter our search term. So let's go along with, um, this is a pedestrian example, nothing crazy with this one, but 24, 23 um, West Coil Avenue. Now I'm going to drop out the street direction because historically I've learned from doing this a lot that it doesn't get you as old uh, newspaper records. So drop the, the direction and just do the street number and the street in parentheses. Don't even bother with avenue, street, whatever. Just do it this way and you'll get uh, more, you'll get older results. But I encourage you to do every permutation because it will pull different things um, from different eras. All right, so the screen it gives you is this one. Um, it goes with most recent first. And if you're a historian, you want to see the oldest one first. So just change it to oldest first. 
and we see a classified ad from March 8th, 1925. Okay, so if I was doing research on this building, I would click through each and every one of these. Um, but tonight we'll just click on the top one. And it takes us to this view. Um, whoa, it's like an old timey newspaper on your screen. <laughs> so you can either download it right off the bat, which is what I normally do, and then zoom in on the PDF. Um, that's just the easiest thing to do um, and find exactly where your um, address is listed. Um, I already did that for us through the magic of this. And this is the ad that was from March 8th, 1925 in the Chicago Tribune. Um, you can see it's a ad for sale. Um, ooh, okay, by owners. The neighborhood was called West Rogers Park then, still is. It's a new brick bungalow. Okay, yeah, 1925. This was built in, I think, 1924, so it is new. Um, Oh, a glazed-in sleeping porch. That's so interesting. Typically, sleeping porches, you know, for when it was hot, and you didn't have AC, so you just slept on the porch. Um, hot water heater, choice home district price, $12,750. If this is your house, you don't have to say how much you paid, but it was probably more than that. Um, so yeah, so this is just the kind of stuff you can find from the mundane to the very dramatic. Um, be open to it if you're going to search. Okay. Cool. Time check. 6.51. We're coming in on time for questions. Okay. So those are the six basic steps. I also want to address these questions. Um, you may want photos. You may want to know what style your house was. You might want to know what's original. Well, photos is always people's big burning question. And I don't mean to rain in your parade, but they are very hard to find. Um, unless you get lucky with a newspaper article, um, I would recommend that you ask an elder neighbor in the neighborhood. Your house might be in the background of one of their shots. Um, you can look up former owners, you know, through this process. You can identify them and reach out to them through Ancestry if you have their names. Um, or through Facebook, you know, the internet's a very small place. Um, and no one's ever mad if you ask them for, if they have any historic, have any old family snapshots of your house. Um, that's a way to do it. There are also some collections uh, online of neighborhoods. Um, you know, it's not every block, it's not every, every street, but you could get lucky. So uh, check out this link, the Chicago Collections. Um, Chicago Public Library has the neighborhood archive as well. You can go to the Chicago History Museum, that's CHM, once they are back open again and, you know, talk to their librarian and see what kind of neighborhood photos they might have. Um, same thing if you have a neighborhood historical society, um, you could get lucky there. Just depends on what's available in your community. Um, Solzer Library has a North Side collection. Um, their librarian's very nice as well. And helpful. So uh, if you really, really want photos, these are your best bets that I've found. If you have another idea, put it in the comments, let us know, like we're always looking for other resources. Um, and if you have old photos, for whatever reason of Chicago blocks, like share them publicly, people are probably looking for that house. Um, okay, these are what you want. I know these are what you want, but they're very hard to find. Um, if you came to this webinar just hoping to find out what style your house was, I'm really sorry you sat through all this. Uh, these are two great guides uh, to figure out the exact style of your house. Um, you can also go to our website. We have different bungalow and vintage home styles in Chicago kind of explained. You can also just email me or Carla Bruni on staff your address and we will get very uh, granular with what style your house is. Um, this is something that historic preservationists very much enjoy doing. Um, so don't be shy. You're here to help. Um, if you're trying to figure out what's original and what's not original, uh, without seeing your house, it's very hard for me to tell you. However, uh, you have neighbors and bungalows, other neighborhoods were built at the same time by the same people with the same resources. So it's a pretty good uh, resource to go into your neighbor's house and if they have something there, 
that's still there it could very much have been in your house originally um, and if you want to bring back an element or you know go back in time with a remodel or restore um, missing elements you know it's in the spirit of history if you base it on something in your neighborhood as well. Um, you can also visit your local historical society. You can look at like Women's Day from, from the day, from back in the day. So trade and ladies magazines have a lot of interiors um, and styles and trends. Antiquehome.org is great. They show like kitchens and bathrooms. They also went all in on um, these paint schemes and paint, picking paint is really hard. So they have some great like paint combos that are historically appropriate. So if that's something you're interested in, you know, a uh, place to consider. I love maybe a little too much this home builders catalog. Um, Archive.org has a whole bunch of um, primary trade booklets and catalogs that they've digitized that you can just go through at your leisure. Um, so they, there's a whole, um, 1928 home collection. There's some bungalows there, some non-bungalows. This is cool because while it's just an ad for a building plan um, that you're you know, not gonna see the full blueprints for, it does have a pretty detailed floor plan here. So, uh, you know, based on a little archeology span in your house, based on the shape or feeling, <laughs> you might be able to figure out if you have, um, have somewhat of a match. So. Uh, you know, click on this link, go through, get weird scrolling, um, clear your schedule, grab a snack before you do it, because you'll want to look at like all 500. But it's a great resource. And then um, the sister to the Home Builders catalog with the home plans is this materials and equipment one, which I love too. And there are more than just this edition. If you are on archive.org, uh, you can see, you know, a wallpaper one, a paint one, a you name it one. Um, and you can look at where people got the building materials for your house in a catalog and get creative and match some stuff up. So that's another thing. If you don't know what to do with your time, this is good. So a um, few parting thoughts here. Um, be patient, be persistent. Be open, um, just like genealogy, if you've tried doing that for people, doing the same thing for your building, you have to keep at it. Um, when you're using uh, those digital searches, make sure you try as many different combinations as you can think of. Um, there could be something different under a full out spelling or a different spelling. Beware alternative spellings of names. Uh, you know, as records get digitized, for example, in the census, um, people have bad handwriting, the digitization doesn't capture it. So don't let that stop you um, from digging a little deeper. Uh, think about contemporary events. I think it makes the history of your home richer to think about the lived experiences of people in your house. Um, don't be afraid to ask the librarian for help, either digitally or if you're lucky enough to go to an archive or research center. Um, they've heard it all before and they're there to help. Um, once we do go back in though, make sure you check hours and procedures ahead of time. Like you don't want to roll in with a um, pen or Sharpie in a pencil only place. Um, make sure you give yourself way more time than you think like, okay, this will probably take me an hour. It will take you three hours um, unless you're super lucky. So give yourself more time than you think you need. Keep orderly notes because you're going to want to go back and look at it, look at it again. Make sure you can find it again. And then lastly, uh, you know, if you're doing a full up, write up history of your house, you're detailing out everyone who lived there and all the things that happened. Make sure that you include yourself because time will march on and then some other owner in the future will wanna know exactly who you were and what you did. So do them a solid and um, make sure that you have that available. And yes, we will be sending out these slides. Um, okay. Before we take questions, I uh, just want to plug our next upcoming webinar, Wednesday, June 24th, 6 to 7.30 with Carla Bruni. She's our preservation specialist. She's fantastic. She literally wrote the book on Bungalow Maintenance 101. She'll be there. And then 
our fourth annual bungalow garden contest is now open through July 7th. Enter before noon on July 7th. For every entry, we will be donating $25 to a South or West Side community garden. And then the winner of the garden contest gets cash prize, other cool garden stuff from our sponsors. And then um, we'll have a random drawing of rain barrel recipients. So you can get real green this summer. Um, okay, so that is my light housekeeping. Now when things are gonna get interesting here with questions. So we will go to the questions and I will read them off and do my best to answer them. If I don't know the answer to your question, um, we, I will find out and we will include that in the email that we send after this presentation. Um, we will send a link to this presentation and to the recording and to the blog and to the worksheet. So we will hook you up. You can share this with friends. We're not um, proprietary. This, this, is for, this is for all of Chicago. Okay. Thank you again for coming and spending your um, evening with me. I know you have other options. Okay, so let's go to the top. Okay, what would stucco be listed as? Okay, that is a fireproof material. Um, it would be, I think they actually call it out. If you go through and click on um, in the blog, if you click on the uh, resource for a key for the Sanborn maps, it will tell you all of the different elements and um, stucco, if you have structural clay tile under your stucco, it will tell you that. So just look at the key. Look at the key is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Um, is the Cook County Assessor's Office the definitive source for home age? Ah, okay. Yes, this is a great question. Um, so remember the first step we did was we went to the Cook County Assessor's site. We found out that house was built in 1916. Um, and then once we pulled the building permit, we saw that it was actually completed in 1915. Now, um, I think that the Cook County Assessor's site is kind of like a ballpark figure when things were first taxed or when it was occupied. So it's not really like who lived there when it was first done. So if you find everything else that says 1913, I would go with 1913. Um, so that's why great place to start but not the end all be all. Okay, sales document said building 1920, assessor site, yeah, go with I typically go with what's older. Um, sometimes the Cook County Assessor site is like decades off. So um, if you have other supporting documentation, go with that. And then um, where's the historic bungalow district permit info located? So, oh, so if you're in a historic Chicago bungalow district, you can find the National Register nomination. It will not have a copy of your specific permit, it will have um, the information from your permit in the nomination form, typically at the end. And if you go to our blog, I have listed out all the links to the districts um, if they are available online. If you click on that link and it brings up something that you can't access, recopy the name of the district from that landing page into the search bar, click on that, it will refresh it. Sometimes the government's page gets wonky. So um, go to our blog and find them there. If you have problems finding it or if yours is not yet digitized, email us, we will get you a copy. Okay, is there no other way to access census records online except through ancestry.com? There are other places. Um, if you, there's a link, go to, look up genealogy. Try to find a Chicago genealogy site. Um, they will have them, they will have locations listed out for where you can find census records. Ancestry.com is like head and shoulders the easiest way to do it. And I'm not sponsored by them. Um, and since they're free through the end of the month, I really wanted to mention that one. Um, but there have been other, there are other places that you can do it. Um, maybe we can email about that and I can help you find exactly what you're looking for. Um, and then a source to decipher old Deed ledgers, oh gosh. Deed ledgers are tricky. Um, one of our community liaisons worked for the registrar's office 
um, I will ask her. This is not my specialty. Um, so we will circle back to deciphering deed ledgers. Okay. Any suggestions if your building permit is hard to read? Okay. This is a great question. Um, I suggest playing with the filter options in the form. I suggest downloading it and playing with the filter options on your thing. And then if it's really illegible, which does happen, email UIC. Um, if you go through, remember when I opened that web page at first, there was all that explanation about how to use the website. Buried in there somewhere is a, um, what to do if you can't read it. Email them, or if it's missing altogether, because some are missing altogether. Um, contact the librarian and they will move heaven and earth to help you. Okay, and then how do you do ProQuest search? Why do you use quotation marks with an address? Okay, so ProQuest is the search engine for the newspaper archives, um, accessible through CPL. You can, accept, you can look up other things on ProQuest um, or it hosts other um, archives. I use quotation marks with the address because otherwise it will pull entries for anything with that number, anything with that street. So putting the quotation means that it's in that order. Um, hopefully that makes sense. And then did you give me the link to the blog you referenced earlier? Um, yes, it's, we'll, we will email you the link to the blog I, I mentioned earlier. And um, if you just go to chicagobungalow.org, our website, and go to the blog, um, you can get there, um, you'll see it. It's called House Research 101, um, but we will email it to you as well. And then if you live outside the city, up in Skokie, we are able to use many of the same resources you provide links to, or do we need to find more local resources? Great question. Welcome, Skokie. Um, so you, you can use the Cook County resources, like the assessor site. You can use, um, you know, the newspaper resources, you might want to get more local, the Sanborn maps, um, they should, I'm not sure. I, you know what, I have no idea. I would recommend that you get in touch with a librarian in Skokie or, you know, look at the resources that we provide and then go and try to find the equivalent um, on your library site. Um, there will probably be more than you think. And you can still email me questions if you want. I'm happy to help you dig into this too. Um, okay, did we miss everything? So they used to have the Illinois, well, if you're in Skokie, I don't know if you can, so, okay, question. They have Illinois Sanborn maps on Chicago Public Library. Yes, um, you need a Chicago Public Library card to log in there, so. Uh, if you're outside of the city, hopefully you can do it somehow. Find a friend um, or go to a branch and then you can do it too. Okay. Question and answers. That was exciting. Do we have any more questions for the room? Um, once again, uh, my email will be listed here. This is me right now. Um, if you have any questions that you thought of or as you come back to the material, you're thinking something pops up, just email me. Um, if I don't know the answer, I will find out. And um, I just wish you the best of luck. This has been so much fun having you here this evening. Uh, all right, Gillian, anything else on the back end here? All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Have a great evening, stay safe everyone. We hope to see you in person real soon.